Hello. Hi there. Uh, How are you doing? Good. I'm glad you could join. Of course. Um, all went well. <laughs> Thanks. Well, to start off with um, a little intro for those who are joining or who are going to be watching this later. Um, this is the Bottom Drawer series by the Bottom Foundation. It's a new online series. Um, I'm Chelsea Pettit, I'm Head of Arts, um, and we're kicking off the first one today um, with the journalist and editor Zah Ankir. Um, this series is basically about writers, um, asking them to ponder some ideas around what's inspired them, what's inspired them to write, um, what were their earlier efforts like, um, how did they get into writing, what are some of the published materials, and um, these are often described as those left in the bottom drawer hence the title. Um, as I said, Sada is joining us for the first time um, for the first series, and we are over the moon to ask her a few questions about how she got into what, doing what she does. Um, just a brief bio for those who don't know um, all of what she's been doing. She's written for magazines, um, uh, material, online papers, uh, Los Angeles Times, Vice, um, so so many. They're all listed on her website. Fantastic portfolio of, of things to read that look at the intersection of politics and culture, society in the Middle East. Um, and she's the editor of Our Women on the Ground, which is a collection of essays by Arab women journalists reporting from the Arab world. And she's holding it up. I've got mine right here. And I did just want to really kick off with this because it would be remiss of me not to mention the importance of this book. Um, I'd love to know really how it came about. There, there's a lot of interviews and things with you about this book because it's been so important and there's been a whole year of you about it. But how yeah. did it come about? I think it was a culmination of years of um, observing Western media coverage of the Arab world, not just observing, I was a participant because I worked for Bloomberg News um, from Dubai during the Arab Spring. And my feeling was always that I was drawn to the voices of local journalists on the ground um, because I felt that they were doing unique work that was getting a bit closer to the story than foreign um, correspondents tend to and also the women in particular had very unique access to uh, particular stories uh, because they were able to navigate spaces that their um, peers were unable to navigate um, in particular societies that are more conservative than others, for example. Um, so my feeling was always that, you know, the women uh, were doing unique work. They were facing unique challenges to bring us those stories and yet they were not being celebrated in the way or recognize in the way that I believe that they should be in um, a more sort of broad space, including the memoir writing space in publishing, but more generally just in journalism in general, I feel like while there have been improvements, um, we still need to, uh, to do more to prop up the voices of local journalists and to really acknowledge that they're doing so much incredible work uh, under very difficult and extreme circumstances. And this is their hope. They're not about to get on a plane and leave um, when their assignment is done. Yeah, and I have to say, I, when I first came across this book, I thought to myself, I can't believe it hadn't been done before. And what, uh, and a, what a sort of a milestone to mark, uh, especially at this time, to be able to bring 19 Arab women journalists' voices together. And you talk a lot about it's, it being, um, it was from sort of, you found sort of social media, but also who've been around. But there's also such a fantastic mix of personal um, stories, political stories, um, some of which are, you know, extremely heartbreaking, some very sad, some have a bit of humor and really fantastic of, of work. So many congratulations. I hear the anniversary coming up next month and something new editions coming out. Yeah, so um, we are publishing a new edition. It is essentially the same content, just with the US cover, which is a little bit more popular, I think, than the um, the UK cover. Well, different people have different tastes. So that cover will be uh, available in the UK and there's been high demand for that. So quite happy with, with um, yeah, a new publication date. <laughs> Good, well, we look forward to that. And hopefully you'll uh, still be out there talking about the book um, in a lot more detail. So, yes, I, I've, I've been talking about it for a year and I'm happy to do it for another. <laughs> <laughs> I might reach the time out at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because I, although the book is, um, maybe has, you know, has an under 
sort of sadness running throughout. I actually find your writing generally, all the different pieces that I was talking about, um, especially on food and art and literature, um, it's actually quite positive and quite celebratory. And I really like to be able to sort of find the stories that otherwise might be reported in a negative way generally. Um, and I just wonder if you could shed some light on how you found your voice within wide ranging topics that you cover and talk a bit about your writing style. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think it took me a long time to find it, to be honest, because I jumped from so many jobs from one job to another over the years. Some of them were a little less, uh, they allowed for less creativity than others. Um, but I was always drawn to telling um, cultural stories about the Middle East because I generally felt as, an, as someone who was observing um, the Western media space that this coverage was not as um, uh, rigorous as geopolitical developments which is normal. I mean, it's it's a region that's rife with conflict, but I'm drawn to those stories because those stories interest me. And they, as you said, they they sort of they're celebratory in a way, but they also illustrate some form of resilience and creativity. A lot of the stories I've written are about very resilient women um, under difficult circumstances, uh, artists, um, film, uh, theater. Uh, for example. Um, uh, I, I wrote about a theater um, that was broadcast live from Gaza. Um, that sort of story really um, is a to me because it tells a story, a, a layered story about the region and it illustrates the resilience and the creativity of its people. And in a way, I think it provides a more complete understanding of the region. Um, and that's why I'm drawn to it. And just it's just my personal interest as well. I love film, I love literature and I'm Arab and I'm, you know, proud of my cultural roots as well. So it's a combination of those things. And the feeling that I always want to sort of add edge to my stories is always there. So I like to add some sort of humor. I sometimes like to add sarcasm. I started a blog at some point called Florence of Arabia. I kind of cringe when I think about it because I was sort of young and desperate to, to be creative. <laughs> um, but I wrote satirically about the region too. Like that, it's, it's sort of a mix of factors where I was just trying to do something different than what the predominant narrative offers, which is, you know, updates on uh, on the geopolitical situation, which tend to be quite grim. Mm -hmm. So th this Florence of, of Arabia, was this um, one of your early efforts then? <laughs> yeah, actually I credit that blog to so much of my growth uh, as a writer and as a journalist because I, so I was one of very few um, female bloggers who sort of had attention in, in the Middle East uh, blogging uh, space. It tends to be dominated by men. There are some fantastic female bloggers as well, but I generally think that, you know, males dominated that space. And I just wanted to have a voice. I wanted to, I did actually write a lot of cultural stories on my blog first, and that's how I started to get attention. And I think one of the early pieces that I ran, because I was also commissioning pieces for my blog, one of the early pieces I ran was by Vivian Salama, who's uh, a journalist. She works for CNN, CNN now, but I worked with her at Bloomberg. And at some point she was the Associated Press Baghdad bureau chief. And I was good friends with her. And I mean, I still am good friends with her. Um, she was leaving Baghdad and feeling quite emotional about it. And she also loves food. So I just suggested to her, like, do you think maybe you could write a piece for my blog about leaving Baghdad? And, and she wrote it and it was centered on food. And it was such a gorgeous piece and it was actually the most popular piece on my blog um, with, the, you know, definitely the highest engagement rates. And that also demonstrated to me their sort of appetite for this sort of alternative story or like behind the scenes story of like what a journalist sees, what they smell, what they encounter on the ground. And, uh, and yeah, I actually, I thank uh, Vivian profusely for that because I think that was a really uh, a core um, moment in my career where I felt, okay, I loved editing this story. I loved commissioning it. Commissioning it. I knew Vivian would do it well. I, I imagined what it would be like on a bigger scale that was away from my blog and in an actual book that people would buy. So that really excited me. So I suppose that's some early editing then that you were really looking at. If you were, if you were being a, an editor early in your career and thinking, what do people want to hear? Who do I hear from? And bringing those voices together, it was good practice for that in the blog world. It definitely was. And actually, I've always sort of like, I definitely consider myself a writer and a journalist, but I always say that I'm an editor too, because so much of my career has been about editing. Um, I edited the student newspaper at the American University of Beirut in 2000 from, I think it was 2005 to 2006, 2004 mm -hmm. to 2006. So that was a tumultuous time in Lebanese history. I mean, it is a tumultuous time right now, but it was it was quite tumultuous back then because the prime minister had been assassinated 
Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, a former Prime Minister at the time. And um, as a journalist or as an editor, I was an aspiring journalist, really, um, heading up this newsroom um, at AUB, which is the biggest liberal arts university in the Middle East. Um, there was so much politics infused in what we did on a day-to-day -day basis because the, the campus was kind of like a microcosm for national politics. So it really yeah. was like a high profile job in, in the sense that, you know, we had a very high circulation and a lot of people wanted to know what the student body felt and thought of national developments. So that was a really formative experience for me too. And a lot of the women that I worked with in that newsroom remained close friends of, of mine because we developed such strong bonds the newsroom was majority male, but there were many females. And one of the women is actually in this book and her name is Noor Malas. Um, so oh. yeah, I I think I edited one of Noor's first columns way back when, so yeah. Oh, Cause you've, uh, you have lived, worked in various places in your career um, and you know, you're, you're still young. You still have lots to do and, and lots of places to and, and write about and meet people. But how have you been sort of maintaining those relationships as you move on? And, and what kind of formative, um, what other writing experiences um, have you had along the way? Um, I mean, I would say that my, you're right, I've worked in many different places. So I worked in Beirut as a local journalist for many years. You know, I covered political assassinations. I, I covered the aftermath of the 2006 war. I covered cultural, um, social stories that were quite taboo. Um, and then I also, uh, w when I moved to Dubai, I was an as economics and a finance reporter for Bloomberg News. So I did a lot of sort of stock market coverage and sort of the drier aspect of news, but I always was drawn to like the, the most, actually one of the, one of the women in the book says, that she's like, I would, I would find the most extraordinary moment in an ordinary situation. Um, and, you know, I would end up writing things like, whatever corner of, of the story would interest me, I would go to that and try to flip it to that angle. But then I think when I left Bloomberg, it was around the time that I sort of had started and folded my blog, which got me into a little bit of trouble at work. <laughs> um, I, I felt, uh -oh. well, yeah, because it you know, wasn't really allowed, but I kind of did my thing. Um, uh, I felt very much that, you know, I wanted to sort of indulge in this aspect of my writing that I had just been tiptoeing around all these years. So that's when I really started pitching like cultural stories about the Middle East and like actually traveling places to write those stories. Like I wrote about the circassian community in Jordan, which is a fascinating community. I wrote about them from sort of the, the perspective of their food culture. I wrote about um, an Egyptian national dessert, Omali. I wrote these pieces for Vice. I don't know if anyone else would publish them. <laughs> but then I wrote about, you know, the cultural history, the cultural food history of Beirut, for example. So those stories actually bring me such fulfillment and joy. Um, because as I said before, it sort of offers this alternative narrative that's fascinating. That's really, and even me myself, someone who's a dual national and I spent the first years of my life here in the UK because my parents left Lebanon during the war. I'm, I'm learning all of this myself, you know, like for me, this is like writing and journalism is, and editing is a, is a real adventure for me. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, a, you know, I learned a lot from the women in this book, you know? Yeah. Um, and you, I would say like the thread is that I continue to be really, really inspired by, uh, by Arab women and their resilience uh, and, and just in general Arab culture as well. And, and this book is rich with those things. So despite all of the sort of the difficulties in the backdrop, you still have this sort of sense of resilience there that is, is really, really, um, it permeates the pages of this book. And it, and it also sort of, uh, you can trace it in my career as well. Yeah, no, it certainly does. Um, be quite inspiring as well. Um, there's a very kind of matter of fact way in which they discuss the kinds of, you know, things that they're going through and how they just have to get on with life. It is their job. They just make it work. And uh, yeah, I think, um, I hope it's quite an eye opener for a lot of people. I think that the, you know, the importance of being able to tell histories as well, or to be able to record these, these moments for posterity is also really important. And one thing I really love about some of the things you've written about was the fact that you always shed some light on the historical context for something to be a certain way, even if it's um, a dessert, <laughs> you know, how did that come about? Yeah. What are the legends around it and what are the real historic contexts? And in a way, this this book, you know, Our Women on the Ground is, is doing something similar. This is the history and within the context that they're, um, they're living and, and surviving and telling their stories, and that there's more 
to come from that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that I really love people to be surprised by what they read when I write something. I think surprise is a really important element. Um, it's not my end goal. I just, I find it enjoyable, this idea that someone might be surprised by something that I produce or read. And I think that takes on a sort of a much heftier uh, role with this book in particular, because my goal partially with the book was also to provide a more complete narrative to mm -hmm. the Middle East and the people um, of the Middle East and the women of the Middle East. And inadvertently, in a way, all the women did this. I never asked them to do it, but their stories are so incredibly diverse and enriching and layered that I think many people have learned so much. I mean, just today, I got this incredible message from a woman who had said, you know, she's immunocompromised. She's not been able to leave the house for the entire, you know, uh, duration of the pandemic, which is four months. And she didn't know anything about the Middle East and her friend gifted her this book. And uh, she just said she she was so surprised by what she read and she loved it. And, you know, she Wonderful. she learned something from it. I, I, I hope I'm not misquoting her, but it's along those lines that she learned something from the book. And that brings me profound joy because, you know, she might have had attitudes. She might not have had attitudes, but but something shifted her perception of the Middle East as a result of reading this book. And yeah. that is really, really um, to me, it brings me joy. Yeah, I mean, if, if if a writer can make somebody, you know, shift their perspectives on, on a place in the world or the way people are, and that that's why I read books, and that's why I've always wanted to read books, especially about women in the Middle East. I didn't, you know, growing up in California, didn't know what it was. I had friends from Iran whose families had come from Iran or Afghanistan, and that's all I knew, but I it was really like, and so absolutely, I think um, we talked briefly before about um, Azadeh Moaveni being a really big influence, um, you know, and yeah. sort of reading about... Um, what it was really like in Iran during sort of uh, the revolution as well and, and post-revolution. So it's, it's really, um, yeah, I loved it. Um, I'm really pleased that we can talk about it. But I also don't want to forget what we're here for, which is to talk about <laughs> the unpublished piece at the Juror. Um, I'm sure there's plenty to choose from, things that you haven't published or, or an early piece that, um, you know, you, you decided against. Can you tell us a bit about what you might have chosen to share today? Yeah, absolutely. You know that I had several choices. I, I The one I think to me that stands out because I feel like it's something that I will pick up at some point that I just haven't been able to because it's too emotionally fraught in a way is that so my parents left Lebanon um, uh, during the, the civil war in Lebanon. And my mother had, um, she was quite young. She was 20 years old. She just married my father. She barely knew him. Um, it was, you could say, an arranged marriage. Um, and she um, she was a very sensitive woman. You know, she had a sheltered uh, life in South Lebanon and with a conservative family and suddenly found herself, you know, um, plucked from that world and in another one um, uh, with a new husband and a new culture and a new language. And over the years, she kept um, dozens of diaries um, because she turned to those diaries to, um, it was really, I think, therapeutic for her. And uh, she also, she, she writes beautifully in Arabic, her English is excellent, but it was reading some of those diary entries is also sort of a journey into her, in the growth of her linguistic skills, because now she's a translator um, wow. and she mastered English and, and Arabic as well. But I really get to know my mother in a way that I've, I, I, I can't conceive of getting to know her in that same way today, even if we spoke about those years back then. So the access that I have to all of those diaries uh, is a gift, is a true gift. And my mother gave them to me and entrusted um, that I would maybe one day write something about her experience. Um, and I hope to do that, whether it's a short form or longer form piece, because it tells the story of a young woman who left her hometown, her village, her family uh, in, during times of war to move to a place that was entirely unfamiliar to her um, with, with a husband. She ended up having six children and they moved back to Lebanon. But that journey was fascinating for her and she shared so much of it. So that's something that I hope to surface at some point. And I'm thankful to my mother for giving me, you know, giving me those diaries and trusting me to do that. Wow, that is quite profound to have your mother see that part of her life. You're quite yeah, so I, I, I sometimes, she was so um, rigorous in her writing that I sometimes will go back and like find the exact day, like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think I might have frozen, but I'm hoping. Oh, there we go. Hello. 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 Hello.
Hello. Hi. Sara, if you can hear me. I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay. He was, um, which, what is, what is the book that you wish you'd written yourself? So I, I really thought about this question. It's a difficult one to answer, but I will say that I, this is a book that I read. I was kind of blown away by the ambition and the scope of it. So it's called The Moor's Account by uh, Leila Lalami, who is a Moroccan um, journalist, sorry, a Moroccan writer. Um, and she, she, um, she writes so beautifully about um, uh, immigration and diaspora and um, sort of a split identity, a dual identity of someone who's left their home and, and moved elsewhere. And she deals quite, I think, gracefully and um, uh, with, with issues around race and representation. But this particular book, um, which really feels like a magnum opus to me because it's so vast, it's, it's basically a fictional memoir oh, wow. of a who survived the Navarre's expedition. Um, and essentially he was written out of the historical record and um, her was to write a fictional memoir that centered solely on his experience um, as a slave, as a Moroccan slave. To do that, she had to do such, such substantial research um, and, and the scope of it so wide. And I think just even the subject matter is so ambitious uh, that you really come away with it, like from it feeling that you've, you've kind of been shaken in a way because you've learned this history that was effectively erased from the historical record, but this was fictionalized history that Leila Lalami herself came up with. So that's sort of a, a book that was really, kind of blew me away, really. Not to say I that I, I wrote it because I never could, but. <laughs> <laughs> but just because really, it might have cut out a lot. Yeah. Can you repeat the, um, the author's name and the title one more? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Leila Lalami, The Moore's Account. The Moore's Account. Okay, great. Oh, that sounds fascinating. And a fictional memoir is always really interesting, especially when it's yeah. been put in a particular or historical context that it makes you wonder how much you know what's coming from the truth and what's completely made up really great stuff and i think and that was really her goal as well so yeah and is there a book that you remember reading um or maybe it was just like an article or something that really made you want to write or made you want to be a journalist yeah, there was a piece by Anthony Shadid uh, about the Iraq war. I mean, I had already, to be fair, I always wanted to be a journalist. There's no way to pinpoint one article or one book because I wanted to be a journalist from when I was like, 10 years old. <laughs> but Aww. I think what what really sort of um, opened my eyes up to narrative non reporting that really centers on the experience of like the so-called subject is mm -hmm. Anthony Shadid's writing. And in particular, a piece that he wrote about Iraq, which focuses so much on how Iraqis themselves uh, had experienced the war or were experiencing the war. And um, I was really drawn to that sort of narrative, nonfiction journalism, um, with the eloquence of prose that Anthony Shadid had. Um, mm. And incidentally, his, his, um, his wife, Nanda Bakri, uh, has an essay in, in Our Women on the Ground. And she writes incredibly oh, beautifully as well. It's such a harrowing essay too. So. Yeah, a um, little segue there into the book. But yeah, it, it would be, I would say it would be Anthony Shadid's writing, particularly on Iraq. Fantastic. Great. And I suppose the last question that was sort of part of the premise is writers that have inspired you. It's kind yeah, of, uh, it's almost like a bit of people who've inspired you on this journey, I guess. I think there are so many people. I would say Noan Sadawi. Um, who's an Egyptian uh, writer. She wrote this incredible book called Woman at Point Zero, um, mm -hmm. in which sort of a, a, a woman, um, a murderess, had agreed to tell her like life story um, before her execution. So it tells a lot about Egypt um, and sort of the women's place in patriarchal societies, which I dig stories about that. <laughs> Um, a lot. There's a lot of stories like that in my book as well. But um, but Noah Sadawi is incredibly sort of. Um, she always has been quite brave with her writing. I would say maybe um, uh, Ital Adnan, who's a Lebanese uh, American poet, and she's also an artist. I love her work. Naomi Shihab Nye, she's another another poet. She's Palestinian American. Um, 
uh, as a day of obviously we just mentioned her. She's such a huge um, inspiration to me and she's also a, an incredibly close friend. Um, uh, and I'm very lucky that she is. Uh, and then there's, a, there's actually an Iranian, so this is more contemporary. These are women who sort of inspired me more recently. Um, there's an Iranian American author called Azarin uh, Dervliet Alumi. She wrote a book called Call Me Zebra or Zebra. Um, which really, again, it goes back to the same sort of theme that I love, like just exploring immigration um, and, uh, you know, living in exile. I would say exile is the core word. It's an experience that so many of us Arabs have um, and Middle Eastern people, not just us, actually. It's sort of become um, quite uh, uh, a common experience among many. Um, and she explores that again with, I think, the same type of ambition that uh, Leila Lalami had from the Moors account. Uh, I love that type of ambition. And even though, by the way, I don't write, the thing is I'm mentioning these women, they write fiction. I don't necessarily write fiction myself. Azade doesn't, Azade writes fiction. But, um, but it's still, it, this type of writing still inspires me because it's so ambitious. And again, it tries to surprise the reader and it tries to reframe their interpretations of certain events. And mm -hmm. I think that's really what inspires me. Yeah, because even, I mean, even fiction is coming from a place, right? There's, they're coming from a, a place of wanting to say something. So even then, you know, fiction can achieve so much in terms of inspiration and, um, and, and writing styles and, and, and also help, I think, nonfiction, to, nonfiction writers to think of storytelling um, in, a, in, a, in an exciting way, I suppose, in a different way. Um, but thank you. Yeah, That's such a fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is all about the storytelling and just shaping the story, right? So that's yeah, very true. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Well, is there anything you can tell us about what's next for you, what you're working towards? Yeah, I mean, I hope to um, put together another long form project. Um, I do have, have um, uh, hopes to put together at some point another anthology, maybe not quite yet. Um, similarly on Arab women. Um, yeah, but I am working right now on, a, a, I would say a social or cultural history um, uh, that is surprising in a way. Uh, I can't say how, <laughs> but it oh. very much focuses on um, on the Middle East. Um, yep. Great. Well, um, if there's any, if anybody has any questions, we're coming up in about half an hour, so probably now's the time to send them through. I see um, Habits Book has has sent a a message about fiction with with a good message within it, but I think probably all the fiction books that you that you've listed um maybe we just put together that list on instagram so people know um and can kind of yeah. um, that uh, uh, I, another one would probably be halalia and salt houses that's another one that fits cool. into the same group but i think of of all the ones i mentioned that would be one if someone's interested cool. in the middle east and fiction that they should definitely get that fantastic great well, I don't think there's any other questions yet, but um, thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time to speak to me today um, about all the fascinating inspirations and ideas and things that are swirling around uh, your practice and your writing. Um, I really look forward to what's next, and congratulations on the year anniversary of um, Our Women on the Ground. I look forward to seeing the new edition. And um, I guess just thanks for everybody who joined, uh, who popped in and popped out. There will be a recording of this on IGTV afterwards. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll chase Sarah for that long list of, of amazing um, people that she's mentioned. Um, and do check out her book. Um, uh, it's so worth a read. Absolutely eye-opening and life-changing, um, especially if you want to learn more about the Middle East um, and women journalists, especially. Um, so thanks to everyone uh, for joining. Thank you for the first Bottom Drawer series. This one will be August 11th with Charlene Teo. Um, and thanks again, Sarah. Speak soon. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.